Welcome to episode 13 of season 2 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Monday the 14th of September 2009 and in this episode we're going to get our teeth into open source dentistry. Uh, we'll cover the latest news and events. We've got news about OgCamp followed by another command line love with a difference this time. Uh, then we'll uh, look at the ecosphere and also feedback. I'm Simon and with me this week are Laura. Hello. <laughs> Hiya. 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 Got to use your catchphrase. That went, yeah. that went down well, I think. What have you been up to, uh, Laura? Anything uh, spectacular over the last couple of weeks? Uh, we had the Hampshire Linux user group at IBM Hersley on Saturday for, uh, well, it was kind of a bring a box meet, but it turned out as more of talks and things, and I gave a talk. It was good. Oh, what was about? It? I wasn't there. Were you? I, no, I'm, no, I wasn't there. No. That's, <laughs> that's why I'm asking the question, because you were, and that's obvious. <laughs> In fact, I, all three of I you was were. There, yeah. So I thought it'd be good if I asked. I, I fell asleep during it, so I could ask what it was about. Ah, okay. Uh, I didn't really. It was very good. Yeah. What was it about? It was about Infosilicer, an uh, open source project I worked on last summer with some students. What does it do? Um, it's a piece of educational software for teachers to help them download content from the web and then edit it offline. Oh, cool. It's like a smart wiki. Uh, oh, you mentioned this a little while ago when we talked about taking pictures of Firefox, I think. And you talked about, it's the sugar desktop, isn't it? Yeah, that you, goes on the OLPC laptops and other things. And that's what caused Dave to have such hysterics during Epiplexy. the last record. Yeah, ah, uh, that was it, yeah. Yeah, Dave's not here this week, we should add. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we didn't mention that, did we? Whoops. <laughs> what about you, Tony? What have you been up to this week? Um, I also gave a talk at the Hanslug meeting on Saturday. Um, I gave a talk about... What was yours about? Because I, I wasn't there. there. I, I, what are you? I was, I was even going to preempt that. I gave a talk about podcasting. Um, something. What about, do you know about podcasts? <laughs> very little, clearly, um, uh, including how to set your microphone up properly. <laughs> Hopefully, this week you can actually hear me talking. Um, and I also installed Easy Peasy 1.5, the new release, which is based on Jaunty. That came out in the last week, so I installed that on my netbook and um, then ordered a RAM upgrade for my netbook. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did it come with? Half a gig? Yes, it comes with half a gig. And what have you gone up to? Uh, I've ordered another gig. We okay. have to, it's one of these ones we have to dismantle the whole thing to oh, actually right. get to the RAM slot, which is on the underside of the motherboard. Um, but it just was that's swapping get, so much. That's what you get for buying a cheap laptop in Asda. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> but it was swapping so much, which the previous release didn't do, so I'm not quite sure what the change is. Hmm. Um, but I also then reinstalled a few days later and set the encrypted home up, ah. because I found on Dustin Kirkland's blog the little command line switch that you boot with to enable that option in the GUI installer. And so if, have, you, have you got... Sorry, go on. I was going to say, and he felt the performance didn't suffer enough as it was. <laughs> well, that's it. It was pretty bad before, and it just got a little bit worse. <laughs> So have you done the uh, EcryptFS thing that encrypts individual files, or have you done yes. the encrypted partition? No, it encrypt, encrypts individual files mm. within a within a hidden directory that yeah. then mounts when you log in, yeah. and it encrypts the file names as well. Yeah. So I think the structure is the same. Yeah, that, no, that's the same as what I've done on mine. Yeah, yeah. No, seems to work okay. But it was nice to be able to do it from within the GUI, and it just sort of gives you a special... Because oh, Laura and I had quite a big debate about um, the about pluses and, and, and the pros and cons of, of doing it and whether the user should have the choice and all this sort of stuff. And uh, one of the things that I said, well, you know, if you don't realise you've done it and you have you can accidentally lock yourself out of your disk if you if you hose your partition or something mm. like that, but it actually gives you a special unencrypt mm. combination that you're supposed to keep safe somewhere, which is a random alphanumeric str string um, that you, oh, you know, really? keep on a post-it note or something else. i didn't know that um and then in theory i guess you can use that to unencrypt your uh, oh, right your partition should you need because on karmic there's now on the the release that comes out in october there's now a button you can press to say encrypt my home oh, right. without without passing any strange parameters it's one of the options uh. now oh cool you had a busy uh, couple of weeks on i see <laughs> yeah i um someone filed a bug on launchpad against uh the screencast site and um, because it's not been updated for ages, because I haven't made any screencasts and nobody submitted any. And mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of been a bit slack. So I thought I'd better make some. So I made some. What was the bug about? It was this part of the Ubuntu website is out of date. Oh, really? Yeah. So I thought, well, okay, that's my responsibility somewhat. So, uh, so what, what did you make screencasts about? Um, Ubuntu. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, one about um, the boot screen. So your very first experience of seeing Ubuntu is when you put the CD in and turn it on. Right. Assuming you're not using Wubi. So I did a thing about a tour of the, the you know, the boot screen and what all the options are. Oh, right, yes. Okay. Yeah, you know, when you first yeah. turn it on and you but get says, yeah, Try Ubuntu, install the Ubuntu. One. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Did one about that. One about partitioning. Uh, one about how to install. And one 
the most recent one was uh, how to screencast because the idea is um, not that I should be the one creating all the screencasts, but that I should make a thing that shows other people how to make screencasts. That's the idea. Cunning. Seems, seems reasonable to me, <laughs> yes. really. So go on then, Simon. What else? Have you, what have you been up to? Uh, nothing. Ah. I went to the. You've had four weeks. So you've had four weeks. You missed yeah, the last missed episode. The last you've done nothing. Work. Actually, I was on holiday for two weeks. Did you take your laptop? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Did it work? Yeah. Did you use three G? Yes. Did it work? Hmm. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> Coverage work, ropey or. Actually, I've been doing some experiments with my mobile, and my mobile works better than my modem. I got a, dong- a dongle. Oh yeah. Oh uh, okay. Yeah. Is your I- dongle a three dongle? No, it's not. It's one of the uh, Icon 225s from Orange. Oh, okay. Mm. I've got a 3.1 and it's causing some grief at the moment. Oh, dear. Mm, Dongle grief. We should maybe talk about dongles at some point. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe not. There's all sorts of (laughs) wacky segment titles I'm sure you could come up with for that (laughs) one. Probably most of them inappropriate for a family show. Yes, (laughs) absolutely. But apart from that, not a lot really. Cool. That's good. Everything's worked. Life. You're not fighting bugs or no, no, no. having issues with your no, desktop? No, just go, uh, meh, turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> You're just using it. Indeed. Excellent. Oh, well, sounds like a fun pack show. Oh, it's not the same. Yeah. Okay, we've got on the line uh, Neil Wallace. Uh, hi, Neil. Hi, hi. Um, Neil started um, Open Molar, and I only recently became aware of it and uh, had a little play with it and um, I'm not a dentist and um, yeah don't look at my teeth um, <laughs> but, but Neil presumably is a dentist yes right. so um, and Neil developed this product called Open Molar and I wanted to get him on to talk about it so um, well the first question is what is Open Molar and what does it do well Open Molar really um, is a pretty typical clone of any standard dental practice management software it, it, it deals with you know, it's the one and only application we have running in the practice for uh, keeping notes on patients, sending out all our correspondence to patients, um, doing billing and invoicing, and um, yeah, it's pretty comprehensive in that way. But it, it, yeah, it doesn't claim to be anything out of the ordinary. It's just a standard dental business app. Now, so it, it's more than just the bit where when you're having your teeth checked and they're going upper six, four quadrant missing, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean that that's that's a very you know it's a, it's a key part. You know, dental records are historically very um, important. So that that's that's part of it, the the dental records. But you also, yeah, as you said, you do invoicing part. and billing and yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And and you developed it yourself? Yes, I did. Um, From scratch? Pretty much. I um I I we, we had a practice. We, we first computerized the practice in 1996, and we went with the market leader at the time and. We had 12 happy years with them, and then they had a sort of an upgrade and various things about the way we were treated and the way that that application worked and didn't work for me um, huh. just made me realize that if I was going to be using ropey software that was full of bugs, it might as well be ropey software that's full of bugs that I've written. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, to, to give me a, a, ch- a chance to turn them around and, and fix them. But also, you know, t- I, I'm, I'm a firm believer given the experience that we've had, that all software needs to be customized. Yeah, it's, it essentially, it's essential in a business that it needs to be customized so it's as simple as possible for people who are, you know, so that the IT doesn't get in the way, effectively. Huh. Um, you know, I'm, I'm of the, what we've got around about uh, 15 people in the practice using this daily. I'm the only one who would consider myself as a hobbyist in the, in the sort of computer market. Everyone else really doesn't, you know, the less they have to touch the keyboard, the, the better. So, um, I'm trying to actually simplify the daily tasks by um, the way we're doing it. And then, um, you know, what, being in there and being able to watch them use it every day gives me a chance to do that. So were you, um, you said you developed it. Were you developing um, other stuff before you, uh, before you wrote OpenMolar? I, I wrote some software. When I was a school kid, I, I used to use the BBC Micros. I'm, I'm, well, I'm 40 this year, so, you know, that, that gives you an idea. I, I used to mess around programming BBC Micros when I was um, sort of, you know, 12, 13, 14, and then did nothing really with computers because Windows was tedious and it's not a developer's platform. And um, <laughs> uh, it's a bold so, statement. <laughs> um, but I, I, I did want to start writing a few programs again, and I, I bought a copy of Visual Studio and wrote some small applications in 
around about 2001, 2002, just to get back into it. But what kick really sta- what kickstarted started Open Mola? What got, what got you back really? Because this is quite a bit deeper than throwing together a little app in Visual Studio, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. But I think with with programming, from my point of view, I'm a hobby programmer. You you find a task and then you sit and you just pound on it until you've solved that problem. So this was just a kind of a, just a, a bigger mountain to scale, but it was the same process. You know, try and you know think right. I want to have I want to be able to print a formatted, you know, a business card. Uh, how can I get around that? You know, and finding the tools to do it, and, and and Google as your friend, trying to just just put things together that way. I don't believe I don't believe the task could be on anyone. And, and personal computing is about having a box which you tell you know which does you know your bidding. And I think with so many you know good applications around, you know, my daughter's taught Word and Excel and PowerPoint. And, they, they, don't, they, seem, they seem to forget that computers are, uh, are programmable. So yeah, it, it, it's easy to do. It's easy to program these things, and uh, the tools that we've got are fantastic. And if I can do it, I believe anyone can. So, how long have you been working on Open Mola now? Well, we got we we up, we upgraded this uh, the, the system that broke broke on the fifth uh, of November last year. So it's less than a year. So it's less than a year from well, what from from start from start. I. I done a bit of uh, sort of Python programming before, but really this was this was the first full-blown GUI application that I've written in Python. So it's written in Python and you use um, the Qt or Qt or whatever you want to call it, yeah. the, the that um, GUI framework. But, um, what made you choose that? Um, the there was an application I was using called Calibra, which is for it's a, it's a sort of an ebook library. Oh yeah. Yeah, and that that uses it, and I, I I was I was always impressed with the look of that application. I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was written in Python, so I looked at the code of that, and I, I also looked at the structure of how you know the, that, that the guy who wrote that is kind of an old Unix nut, and you know, he's not old, but you know it's kind of old <laughs> school in that all his applications are just a chain of small applications that just do one thing and do it well. Mm. And when you look into the way he's laid out his source code. You could see the logic there, so I thought, right, this is a guy who knows what he's doing. That's the toolkit he's chosen. I'll try it. And um, that's fair enough. Also, I think that the, the, the you know I think all the Python toolkits have their strengths, but the huge advantage of the the Qt toolkit for Python is the book that's been written, um, which is uh, I, I forget the name of it now. It's a very long book, something like developing Qt applications in Python. The you know, the 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 thirty uh, word title which is ridiculous <laughs> the book itself is very very readable you know it's almost um, you know it, it reads almost like a narrative and, and takes you from start to finish and, and so if you started that in November last year and it's now October so nearly a year later yeah. uh, it's now September in fact <laughs> nearly a year later um, and you're now running that software day to day you've completely replaced your proprietary app with something you've written yeah we kind of had to in, in the end I mean you know, this was never my it was never the ideal takeover, but you know, I, I filed a few bugs on the original program. I think 50 on on day two of running this thing, Whoa. and had no response really to any of those. And some of them are critical, and were, were you know were affecting our. If you've got bad software, you know this is dental practice management software. So yeah. if you've got bad management software, you've got bad management mm. by definition. It was affecting the standard of care for our patients, and that was just not acceptable. From day one of running that prof program, we decided we were going to have to look somewhere else. And I, I looked at some of the alternatives and, and was not overly impressed. And um, uh, you know, just, just started to write my few, a few modules to overcome the shortcomings of what the proprietary application did. And that ultimately is what led us into the full-blown application we've got at the moment. You know, we we cut our the license on that. Now our license to run that application will run out in April. So since April, we've been running Open Molder in the practice. And does have you have you found other uh, practices who've been interested in the work you've done? Have you passed it on to to other dentist practices? Um, I've shown I've shown a couple of dentists it, and they're quite interested. But I'm not. I'm I wouldn't be too happy to actually push it out to them. I think what I want to do is build is build the thing, get it absolutely solid. And I I think I've got to have it running in my practice bug free for 18 months before I would even consider pushing it onto someone, just because it is such a critical application. Do you think that's attainable? Uh, 18 months bug free software. No. 
<laughs> okay, let me go back. And once, I think once I've been running it 18 months with relatively few problems, right? I think then I could, with you know, hand on heart and conscience clear, go to other people and say, right, th this software does what your current package does, but this is free software, it's modifiable, and, you know, it has all the benefits in kind. So, you know, once another practice starts using it, that, that brings in issues. I mean, it would be great to get some more feedback and ideas about features and how they could change rather than it being just driven by me and mm. you know, my practice. There would be a downside to the, you know, I would then have to think whenever I make a change, if I, I've, got to, I've got to be 100% certain it's not going to break whatever data they've got in their schema. Yeah. You're all aware, you know, there's a big difference between theory and practice when it comes to software, and, you know, it's very heavily tested. I have my own, you know, I've, I've, I run it on my laptop, which has got a kind of a full trial version of the software, but it's also got my, 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 my real data, which makes it a completely, makes the application a completely different beast, you know, if you change what's in the database at the back end. And I've just had a, a, a gentleman join the project. I don't know if you know the project's ho hosted on Launchpad. Yeah. Um, I've just had a gentleman join the project. He found it on there, and um, he's a, a DBA by profession, and he's really enthusiastic about the fact that this is GPL, etc., etc., and he's going to help me completely rewrite the schema, which I'm, I'm quite excited about. I, I've rewritten a few of the tables, but um, you know, I, I originally wanted to keep the schema the same for a variety of reasons. You know, one that it, it meant that this company here had annoyed me so much. You know, I, I originally thought, you know, I was going to be, I was, I was, uh, as though I, I had a duty to sort of get vengeance against them, and if I kept the exact same schema, I could. Or make it easy for people to transition. Or clients, or yeah, pinch right, clients, okay. Yes. However, um, with passage of time, I realized that that schema is a lot of the issue. Right. And, um, you know, it's actually holding me back more than, you know, giving me that opportunity. Do you find that other dentists that you talk to understand the benef well the reasons why you did it, sort of the benefits of the open source free software aspect, or do they just see it as yet another piece of software? I think I think the latter. Uh, do, I think do you think there's a, there's a huge lack of understanding for open source, and I think most dentists have had such a torrid time from IT companies that as soon as you start talking about IT, they just glaze over. They're, they're used to being. You've got to. You've got to remember that what they get attacked by salespeople. If you go, if I went along as I did to the BDA conference in Glasgow this year, yeah. um, there were probably six or seven companies there with big, glossy stalls and uh, you know reps trying to pull you in and, and tell you that they've got the greatest and the latest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you think the fact that you you're less keen to get other people involved in using your software might be potentially hampering your ability to gain community adoption and without community adoption you're you're restricting your ability to say hey look at the great community behind this and look there's no single corporation because at the moment you are the person behind it and you're pretty much the only person behind it yeah, aren't you? I, I, I think you're absolutely right there uh, I, I um my, my my philosophy is, however, that you know, um, initially I, I initially I went out all guns blazing. You know, this is going to be the best thing since sliced bread. Come on, jump over, have a go at this, etc. Yeah. Et and then I realised that people will take a look at it as soon as you do that. But they'll take a look, and they'll make an opinion, and they'll clear off if it's not exactly right. I, I think, sadly, that the market for this type of application is only for a mature product. Mm. Yeah, you couldn't you couldn't have you know done the song and dance about it, you know July last year when it was in embryonic stage Absolutely. perhaps, but even July but now yeah. you already you already run it on your on your practice and you run your practice with that software. Yeah. So it's clearly good enough in inverted commas. Yeah. I guess you don't want to spend half your time doing support for other practices as well, though. Well, I don't know. It's, well, it's just as lucrative. Yeah. Isn't it? I was say, there is money in support. That's for sure. I mean, you must. Now that's quite interesting. I, you know, I was going to ask you guys this. I, I um, am the, uh, you know, the, the sole um, IT support for the practice at the moment, and that makes me horrendously uncomfortable for a variety of reasons. One is that I'm, you know, I'm not an IT professional. I'm just, I'm just a hobbyist, and although I can set up networks, etc. I think you do yourself a disservice yeah, to say you're a hobbyist <laughs> to develop a piece of a platform that your <laughs> dentist practice runs on. But yeah, okay, yeah, I get well, your point. Okay, okay, but I mean, as as you, I think with, I think with computers, the more you know, the more you realise you don't know. Yeah, you know, um, 
the sysadmin, sysadmin side of things is, is totally and utterly beyond me. I think, you know, com compared to, I, c I can I can think logically and do the programming side of things, but you know, to, if, you, you know, the sort of support calls that just drive you mad. You know, you get a sort of a disk not found error on your server or something along those lines, and you know, if that happens, if I, if I'm there, I can fix it in no time, and I know I've got a spare server up in the thing, and I've just got to plug it in and reconfigure Wicked so it's got the right IP and etc. etc. Yeah. There's no one else who could do that. But it sounds only like, or in the practice. So it sounds like you need some kind of support infrastructure for. Well, that just sounds like you know your average tech support. You know. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I you need. I, I really need people who are. There's, there's, there's two ways to support this product. There are, there, there are going to be people who would... If you were, if you were supporting Open Molder now, you'd get someone who would ring you and say, I've got Mrs. Jones in the chair. She's got a bridge. I've tried to charge it. It won't, it won't come up with the right amount. What have I done wrong? Mm. You know, that takes a intimate knowledge of the product itself or, or the application itself. But then there's the other type where it could be someone like myself who rings in and saying, right, I can't get the application running. Why not? Mm. And, and that, it, you know, there are two very distinct levels of and is that is that the is that the scary thing is that if you if it went out there to other practices you you'd have to support that even okay. though you know that as a community project as an open source project anyone could technically support it yeah yeah absolutely um, I'm I'm looking forward to I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to the day when someone does come on board and just say right I that, I I like what you've done with this let's let's try and get a business going around it I you know my my itch that I've had to scratch was to get without this software my practice wouldn't be able to run right so you know it, it, it has it has value to me before I was paying and was quite happy to pay about 500 pounds a month to support the previous application oh, wow <laughs> yeah but then again how much does it cost you in development time to create this product oh I mean it's immeasurable yeah it is it is totally immeasurable um but well, it is measurable, but it's, you know, it's, something <laughs> yes. that, it's something that would be very painful to do. However, you, you know, I, I even now, having you know, having an intimate knowledge of the program and how my network is set up, I would quite happily put someone on the payroll at the practice to come in and do, you know, take that load off me. I'm away, you know, if I'm away on holiday for a couple of weeks, and we get a router blow, you know, I'm not. I, I, it, it's uncertain to me exactly who's going to sort that out. Yeah. But that's, like I say, that's your average tech support. You know, I think um, it's it's been great having you uh, having you on. I, I don't know, are you coming to um, uh, Log Radio Live and perhaps Old Camp? Um, I I would uh, I would very much like to. I think the Old Camp sounds uh, very exciting. You know, just the you know, it, I think sometimes you get more out of a ten minute speech than you do from an hour talk. What? So I, I would very much like to. I'm not absolutely certain I'm going to be there. Well, if you are there, you're. More than welcome to give a talk about uh, Open Molar and also about your your experience in Python and Qt Qt development. That would uh, be fantastic. And the support for small businesses in open yeah. source projects as well. That's I can practically see a full day, really, isn't it? <laughs> you, you don't have to do all of those, obviously. <laughs> Laura, with, with that in mind, I would actually just say that you know, um, when you're starting out a project like this, you, you do make certain choices that you often go on to regret. You know, you choose a language and you think, oh, I wish I, it would have been, I would have had an easier time in this language you choose a toolkit you choose a database you mm. choose a, 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 a hosting provider and touch wood I am thrilled to bits with the choices I've made Launchpad in particular and, 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 and the bizarre um, stuff it's just first class so if people want to find out more about OpenMola where do they go? well I, I blog about it I've got a blog at Blogspot I've got um, there's a wiki that I've just started because I have as, as I mentioned earlier I've got um, Stephen Smith coming in as a sort of a very important co-developer. So we've started the wiki so that we can document what each other are. Oh, excellent. Um, but it's hosted on Launchpad. All, all of these are linked to from the Launchpad site, which is um, launchpad.net slash openmola. Magic. I'll put a link to that in our, in our show notes. Thank you very much. It's been fantastic having you on. Thanks for talking about it. Yeah, it sounds like a, a really good project for you to have got your teeth into. Oh, oh. Indeed. And if any of your listeners would be kind enough just to... There is a deb available um, link to from that Launchpad site. If anyone would just install it and get back to me with any problems during the installation. Yeah, absolutely. That's going, you know, that could be you know, an absolute uh, dead end if, if for people when I do try and push the application out. Yeah. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you for having me on. Take care. See you. Bye.
It's time for the news, and Microsoft have confirmed that they've provided a set of training slides to Best Buy employees to teach them the so-called benefits of Windows over Linux netbooks. Mm. There's been a bit of an outcry about these slides. There's a whole series of kind of crosses saying, support applications, cross against Linux, and yeah. a tick next to Windows. Yeah, and support hardware devices. They've worded it very cunningly. Oh, yeah. But, it, yeah, it, it's mostly accurate, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, some of the things are really... Not that accurate. Well, they, they say it doesn't support a lot of hardware, which is actually less the case. No, it's not days. that. If you, if you, it's well, very okay, cunningly right. The worded. implication is that Linux doesn't support a lot of hardware. Exactly. Yes. The actual minutia. But mm. this is Best Buy. It's like going to Asda. PC World. Yeah, which, is where people to buy, the which is where people buy selling computers. selling you a computer. Yeah, but people do. People walk into Dixon, PC World, that's where they buy the computer. If they're not tech savvy, they're going to listen to someone who spouts a bit of knowledge. Well, it just comes back to whether or not Ubuntu is ready for the general public on the desktop, which yeah. is another good question. Debate in time. Amazon have disabled I Love Me Rose referral account because of the Firefox extension, which, when installed and you buy from something from Amazon, automatically contributed referral fees to the Miro project. Yeah, it was Cheeky. quite cute. No, it was good. It was. I mean, you opt in. You you oh, install really? it. Yeah, it's, yeah, no, yeah. it's a it's a it's a, a thing you put on your Firefox. So if you're ever browsing around the web and then you go to Amazon and you end up buying something, yep. instead of the referral going nowhere, mm. it goes to Miro. But so why do Amazon have a problem with that? I against the T's and C's, isn't it? Yeah, I started trying to read the T's and C's and spot which bit and I gave up. I think, <laughs> it's, something, I think it's something to do with the fact that it's coming from not a direct link from their website. Mm. I would guess from some of the things they said. That's what Amazon... Yeah, it's a shame because it, it's a very easy way to contribute. You know, just yeah, install an extension and then forget about it because it doesn't cost you anything extra. It's a shame. Apple have released Lib Dispatch, the library that provides uh, the implementation of the Grand Central Dispatch services under an Apache license. You know, Grand Central is all to do with multi core optimizations. So it's is all it? about making applications that aren't designed to run on lots of cores run on lots of cores and, oh, really? and be quicker and stuff. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I, I do. I, that does annoy me. I've got the little, the little thing at the top of the screen that tells me how my CPUs are busy, and I've got two cores, and it only ever seems to be fifty percent busy. Yeah, because the apps aren't written multi-threaded. Yeah, it makes me sad. I don't know whether this oh. stuff will ever get into Linux or whether it's compatible with, with the Linux okay. kernel or yeah. whatever. But you know, it's nice to see Apple contributing stuff under open source licenses. And finally, my Torola has announced its first Android phone, the Click, which will go uh, to T-Mobile mm. in the UK. And Orange, I guess, if they merge. Yeah. Oh, if, yeah. If. Works for me. Yeah. I'm looking at the HTC when my contract expires. Meh. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, hang on, what platforms have we got in the room? I've got a Symbian phone. What have you got? Windows <laughs> Mobile. Yours is a Windows <laughs> Mobile. Yeah. Tony, what's Mine's yours? whatever my Samsung U600 runs. Oh, so it's some... Some surprisingly Samsung thing. Thing. Okay. And what, you're on a Nokia Symbian. as well? You're yeah. Symbian as well. Hmm. So none of us use free software platforms. I didn't buy my phone for the software. I bought my phone for the hardware keyboard, which I now don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Win there. Damn. And I look after my phones, so when I buy a phone... It, it lost it, there, there were no open source uh, phones when I bought Despite this one. Despite the fact they don't work abroad, yeah. Uh, it, it works fine abroad now. <laughs> it does a different picture every time you go to a different country. It's a brilliant phone. Fantastic. It's like a teenage girl's phone. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got some events coming up. <laughs> Software Freedom Day uh, this year, in, in a new all-shortened events section, because it was getting a bit long. Um, so we're only going to read the things that are coming up before the next episode now. So mm -hmm. Software Freedom Day is Saturday 19th of September, this Saturday. And you're doing something on that day. Um, for Ask Bar Camp... <laughs> Sorry, which is the just next screwed that up. Yeah. <laughs> Laura, Laura and I are going to Ospar Camp. We don't know whether Dave is going to Ospar Camp. You remember in the last episode? Oh, he's being all enigm enigmatic, he is, isn't yeah. he? He might be, might not. A little bit elusive, a bit, little bit Paul Sladenish. I think he'll come down <laughs> from the ceiling on a rope like I think a ninja. We get, good if he turns up on a bike. Yeah, yeah. better not be my Brompton, though. That's yeah. <laughs> and he'll be sleeping in your hotel room. On the floor. He won't. <laughs> yes, yeah, Ospar Camp's this weekend in Dublin as well. And I'm doing a lightning talk. Excellent. What about? About him for slicer. <laughs> ah, excellent. So you practice on hand slug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do it for real. At a Pretty event. much. Oh, I like that. Um, yeah, CMS Made Simple Geek Moot 2009 is on the 26th and 27th of September at the Workstation Sheffield UK. 
And finally, Launchpad Community Meetup is on the 28th of September 2009 in London. And we'll put a link on the... Uh, I'll probably be going to that. Oh, will you? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, should be good in London. It seems like quite a few people are going, actually. Cool. Well, a few people have said on Facebook, yes, instead, nah. of, instead of no or maybe, which means nothing. And you'll be there with your that means It means exactly everything. Everybody will turn up. It has to mean that. Yes, that's exactly right. It's time for the latest news about OkaCamp, and Dan from the Linux Outlaws has put together a trailer for it, and it features everybody here. Uh, well, apart from Simon, Is sorry. Because <laughs> Simon, Simon. Right, it features, apart from him, apart yeah. from that bloke, yeah. Yeah, don't worry about it. It features some of the Ubuntu UK podcast team and all and of some the of, some Linux, of the Linux Outlaws team. Let's play it now. Oi! Our theme's better! No, it's not. I think you've broken it now. Mm, guys, maybe we should get on with the promo. Are you wondering what you're going to do with that spare day after Lug Radio Live this year? So were we. But then we had a brainwave. I've wondered what that burning smell was. Why not run a joint bar camp-esque event nearby on the Sunday? So nearby, in fact, that it'll be in the Connaught Hotel in Wolverhampton, the official Lug Radio Live hotel. It's called Og Camp. No, not Odd Camp. That's Og with two Gs. Odd Camp might be more appropriate, though. There'll be all kinds of talks going on during the afternoon. You can talk, too, if you want to. Plus, there'll be a live recording from each podcast in the main room. Ubuntu UK and Linux Outlaws under one roof. So put it in your diaries now. Sunday, October 25th at the Connaught Hotel in Wolverhampton. Visit ogcamp.org for full details. Sounds like a fun-packed event. I love that. That is very <laughs> cool. Good. <laughs> Laura's Dan gone. did a fantastic job. <laughs> he has. Laura's got a funny colour. <laughs> But yeah, that's about says it all, really. Um, there's some stuff to update everybody on. Um, we've confirmed the opening times now, so we're going to say mm-hmm. doors are opening at half past ten, um, with a, a short welcome at quarter to eleven. And those first sessions probably will start at eleven, as we advertised originally. Mm-hmm. Um, check out the Log Radio Live website for details about the hotel rooms um, at the Connaught. Um, the Log Radio Live website has been launched now, so yes. it's all there in its spectrum-like goodness. <laughs> um, we've got some sponsors as well. Yeah, we need to thank them very much. Bit folk, good old bit folk. Yeah, uh, Open Learning Centre. Yes, who we interviewed in uh, season uh, early this season, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was episode six. The two Adams and Canonical are providing some prizes. Yep, yep. And we've got a media sponsor. Oh, sorry, a media partner. Media partner. Media partner. Got to get the terminology right. Yeah. Who are the very helpful guys at Linux Format? Cool, fantastic. Um, we are still looking for more sponsors, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> why not? Enough. So uh, if you uh, are interested in sponsoring the event, please look on the org website, and there's a, my email address on there. Send me an email. Actually, there's one sponsor we forgot. Viglin. Ah, yes. Well, they're, they're just being confirmed now. Viglin have, have offered to send us um, a couple of uh, Viglin NPCLs to give away at the event. Yes. So um, come along <laughs> and uh, and uh, see if you can get your hands on one. Fantastic. What, do we, what else do we need? We need some crew. Ah, Yes. Yeah. So, if you fancy volunteering to come and help make sure the rooms run on time, please email us at the usual podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's, that's, that'll, that'll do. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's like you've never said it before. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, what are we after? Um, we asked still after a couple more projectors as well. Mm. So if you're coming along and have access to a digital projector, preferably one that does at least 1024 by 768, mm. um, then please yeah, let we only us know. want to borrow it. We're not going to drop yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I suppose we need to uh, just make sure everybody's happy that we're going to look after them. They're not going to be left in hotel rooms for anybody to walk in and pick up no. and walk away with. That's so, part uh, of the role of the crew is to yeah. make sure the you know stuff doesn't go walkies or anything like that. Yeah, we've had we've had one um, offered to us, but so we are for a couple more. One for each of the rooms. Jobs That'd are good. Fantastic. Yeah, and hopefully you'll come along. and We'll see you on the twenty fifth. Mm, more details at ogcamp.org. We received a submission this week for... Go on, Simon, you say it. <laughs> You've got the best voice. Come on, learn love. Yeah, here's a submission. Baby. Hi, this is Alan Bell from the Open Learning Centre, bringing you some command line love. All the command line programs and their dazzling array of switches are beautifully documented in the manual pages, which can be called up with the man command. So, for example, man ls will show you the manual page for the ls command. It displays the help right in front of the command prompt you're working at, which to my mind is the most inconvenient place it could possibly be. With the help of a little script and an alias line in your bash rc file, 
more details on that in the show notes, you can replace the regular man command with a call to launch the GNOME help application in the background, and that will open the man page that you requested. So this means you can type man ls as usual, but you get your cursor straight back and GNOME help pops up beside the command prompt so you can refer to it as you work. It looks a lot prettier too. Hope that helps, and I look forward to seeing lots of you at the OG camp. Thank you very much indeed, Alan. I tried that. It works really well. Your my microphone's not on, is it? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm just talking quietly. <laughs> <laughs> I tried it. It works. It's really good. That's very cool. It is. It kind of breaks if you use a, if you do man and then something that doesn't exist because gnome then has a fit where no. it can't find <laughs> the man page that doesn't exist. Right. But it, it, for you know, if you do man ls, yeah, you get. A nice graphical window. And presumably it works for other man pages, not just the... Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's specific to man ls. It's the only command. There are a lot of flags. Yes. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I mean, I know exactly what he meant. As, as soon as mm. he, he said about, you know, it opens right in front of you, which is the last place you actually want to be able yeah. to do it. And the number of times I've had man pages running in different screen sessions or using yeah. like Terminator with multiple tabs and things and flicking backwards and forwards trying to work out what's going on. Yeah. It sounds like a really useful solution. It is, of course, only applicable if you're on a desktop and not... If you're I think directly on a server. I think the script he's got detects whether you're running on a desktop. And oh, if it, really? If, it do, if you're not, it just calls the standard man That's formatting. Yeah. Oh, we'll put that in the show notes. That's brilliant. Yeah. Magic. Although you're out of a job now, Simon. <laughs> well, actually, I think it's great that Alan's um, sent in the uh, the contribution. And uh, I look forward to other people doing exactly the same. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Send yeah. us in your command line love. <laughs> We had an email from Callum Craig saying, I would like to contribute to the community a bit. My knowledge is not good enough to really give technical support to anyone, and I can't code, so I can't do any development. So I was thinking about getting involved with the documentation, as I reckon I can write fairly well, and I would mostly likely, most likely understand whatever issues I would be writing about. Now, this is a really good question, because documentation is something that the community always needs, but is perhaps not very glamorous to get involved with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, Simon, you've got involved in documentation before, haven't you? He's not very glamorous. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's harsh. Yeah. 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 Just because you, you've got a soft voice. <laughs> <laughs> I did documentation so for seven nice. years. It's not uh, glamorous. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. it's not. It, it's definitely worthwhile. I um, like Biobu. We've been through Biobu yeah, a number of times. Yeah, mentioned screen profile thing. And the fact is that there was very little in the man page. So, you know, I just thought, well... <laughs> It needs a man page because that's, mm. in theory, the first place you should go to look to see how it works. So I just looked into how it works and I got on to one of the developers, I dust in and said, do you want any help? And he said, well, yeah. And it was as simple as that. Write me a man page. And how, me a man what page. did you have to do? Was it just like open up a text editor, start typing and email it to him? Or was it how, no. You, are there many tools and processes you have to learn? Text to editor. That? Really? really, text editor. Went to um, Launchpad downloaded the latest um, version and edited the man page file with a text editor. So and there's um, a template for the man page files, is there? There is. Right. Good luck finding it. <laughs> well, surely, I mean, you could, if you rummage around in some man pages, you could have a look at what another one looks like yeah. and rip off the formatting, I guess, because yeah. most of them look the same. The thing is that, um, certainly in Dustin's case, he knew exactly what he wanted with a man page. Mm. Right. And therefore, my first attempt was a complete rewrite. Right. right. The problem with that is that it would have taken him a long time to check and work through, and he's a busy guy. Mm. And so it needed small changes. Right. Small change, push it, small change, push it. So, uh, you know. So who were you writing the man page for? What sort of audience did you have in mind? Um, new users. Right. Somebody who came along and wanted to know what it does and how to do it right i so must admit that i've been slacking recently but um, <laughs> that's another matter I mean, it's but, not finished yet but <laughs> man, man pages of course aren't the only way that you can contribute to a documentation effort no i mean the man pages are great for come online fans as yes. we've talked about before um and with alan bell's little whizzy thing it can be good for the gooey people as well um but i mean the website is one of the first areas that people will see in relation to a project yeah i mean when they when someone needs help with something what are they going to do what, what, what does your average user do well they don't read documentation do they because nobody knows <laughs> you know, for the vast majority of them don't, they don't but what they might do is search for error messages or right. search for the name of the product mm. or, or something you know relating to what they want to do and the name of the product 
And that will usually turn up something like a forum post, mm-hmm. uh, a wiki page, mm. or the official documentation. I must admit, whenever I've had problems with Ubuntu, I've stuck something in uh, a search engine and come up with a usually an Ubuntu forums post. Now, I'm not a forums fan, I'm not a forums user, but there are a lot of people who are trying to do similar things. And There's a vast amount, vast of, amount of stuff in that, out there. In, that, in the forums. Yeah. And people write how-tos, they write documentation on how to you know, fix your video drivers and how to you know, install certain packages and so on. Does any of that stuff ever get pulled over to the official uh, Ubuntu help pages? Well, the implication by you saying official is that the forums aren't official. Well, they're the official forums, but... They're not the official documentation, though, Because isn't there wiki.ubuntu.com and help.ubuntu.com or something? The, the official documentation site is help.ubuntu.com. That's right. where that's where all the yeah. help documentation is. Now, within that, there's if you go to that URL, help.ubuntu.com, that's where you get to the main documentation. Now, that's mm. created by the doc team, the documentation team. Okay. And that's um, fairly well regimented in the way that it's structured. Mm. Um, but there's also, if you go to help. sorry, help.ubuntu.com slash community, is a wiki for documentation. So that's less structured. More freeform, <laughs> right? If you if you sort of mean like yes. you know a wiki page would be. I've never been involved with an open source documentation project, but I'm, I went to I used well I used to, was a technical writer um, for a company for seven years, and I went to a KDE documentation project talk at Fosdem a couple of years ago, and it was really interesting how similar what they did was to how we've done it in a company for years. Is that, Pop- did you find that surprising? I did because it was a community voluntary effort and i just kind of thought it would be done differently i think now it's probably because the people who start the project or are in charge of the project are technical writers yeah. privately as well commercially right. um but the, even the problems they had like translating screenshots it's a nightmare of a problem because you have to be able to of bring course. it up in every language and mm. if i mean in a company, you do maybe nine languages as standard, but in Ubuntu, it's just incredible Lots. numbers. Cling on. And because, but because they were a community, they could bring up, like, different people could bring their skills to it, and they came up with this fantastic script that automatically recorded the setup and did it zillions of times and threw all the output into CVS. And it was just like, wow, that's really cool. And yeah. um, so, yeah, and it, all the processes are the same, and... Uh, so, I mean, if you're into, <clears throat> you don't have to be writing the English documentation. You could be doing translation. You could be helping with the process. And I think one of the things they said is that because a lot of people don't aren't into using SGML or XML and things that it gets produced in, they do what Simon did and write in a text editor. And then somebody else who knows how to use the tools can convert it to the right tools ready for mm-hmm. translation and production. Yeah, that's the thing. Because I'll, I'll, if it doesn't really matter which, which um, avenue you go down. If you go down the man page route, there's obviously a specific formatting for that. Yep. If you were to look at um, help.ubuntu.com, that documentation is written using DocBook, I believe. I don't know if they're moving to a different format. I believe GNOME, the GNOME project's moving to a different format. But at the moment, it's docbook. If you go to help.ubuntu.com slash community, that's a wiki, and that's a completely different format again. Mm. And then if you write something on the forums, it's yet another, you know, the forum markup is different from yeah. the wiki. So you, what you tend to find is you get these silos of people. You get people who contribute to man pages, people who contribute to forums, people who go to the wiki, and people who contribute to the doc team. There, it doesn't tend to be people who contribute across all of those, mm. which is why there's a massive difference in the quality, style, and quantity of documentation in those four different areas, which mm. is an issue. Mm. Yeah. Uh, there's also different types of documentation. So we talked about man pages, which is very kind of factual. Here's, here's a, oh, it's almost listing, aren't they? The different options. Yeah. Sort of reference information, isn't it? And you have to give examples and things, I think. Yeah. Um, so you've got that sort of thing. And then you've got sort of how-tos and things, which, which may have a few technical commands in it and perhaps a little bit of explanation. You might get full-on tutorials, which have a lot of explanation, quite wordy. Some, and then something like an FAQ, which essentially is, uh, uh, here's, a, here's a question or an error message, and here's two sentences saying what to do when you get it. Now, I guess the barrier to entry on things like an FAQ is fairly low. Because it, yeah, as soon as you, as soon as you have a bit of knowledge about an answer to a question, yeah. you can contribute. But perhaps the expectation of somebody writing a tutorial is that they've got fairly good skills in whatever language they're writing the tutorial in. So mm. perhaps also, in also about how to educate people. I mean, tutorials mm. a different type of activity to do than it is to read a 
uh, how to, for instance. Yeah, and I was wondering, you know, whether you know whether it's just something that comes from practice or, or there are some well structured ways of formulating those kind of formatted documents mm. whether it's uh, instructional guides or you know training type instructional guides or right. faqs and they're way beyond what i've looked at but i know there are teams who within teams within ubuntu who are looking to um improve those areas of documentation and i know they they need they need help they certainly need help we can we can certainly put links on the in the show notes to mm. each of the different areas and where people can get started uh, with each of the areas, like pointing people to the beginners team in the Ubuntu forums, right. and the doc team in the um, for the documentation. But I mean, written documentation isn't the only way to help people out. I mean, I can see talk- this is galloping <laughs> over a hill towards me. It, yeah, I mean, we did talk about them earlier, but I mean, people can just look at contributing screencasts and yep. and things. It's not that difficult to do. Oh really? It isn't. I, I remember doing oh, a whole yeah, series did. of them. You did, loads oh, you of them, did didn't even you? some of which eventually got published. <gasps> they all get, did. They, well, you say that they're not on the website. Oh, thanks, Tony. Um, but uh, yeah, but yeah, but the people can contribute screencasts to something to uh, in the Ubuntu case to screencast at Ubuntu. Yeah, or and, people can just create their own YouTube channel and yeah, or whatever absolutely. you know. And there are plenty of people out there who do that and are very successful in creating. You know, a, a, a community like the Show Me Do, for example. Yeah, they've they've got a you know massive library of um, tutorial videos. Yeah, and for some people who don't want to read a man page, even though the man page contains exactly the same information as a video tutorial, mm. some people get more from yeah. uh, a video tutorial than they will from a piece of text, even if it's just a video of a command line problem. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe a video, um, of, video of a man page scrolling <laughs> up the screen. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be something in that. I think that's the important thing that. All the different formats all have their place, and you yeah, don't no one want of them to have right. them all the same. And even things like the style and the tools and things, I mean, there are good reasons why they'll use .book or, like I use DitterXML, which is another open standard, and it aids translation. It means you can do a lot of computer processing of it automatically that you can't do with just free text. Mm. But then, as you say, like most people won't want to bother learning those tools. So. Yeah. Well, maybe um, Callum should approach somebody like uh, Neil. Um, and talk to him about uh, Open Mola. Yeah, yeah, about actually, does he need the documentation? Page. And yeah. it will be up to Neil to decide what he's after, whether it's man pages or web pages or something like that. Yeah, so that's a good idea. Finding something a, that's not well documented. Absolutely, a new yeah. or relatively new project that you can get involved in at the yeah. stage. You resisted doing the get your teeth into joke again. I did. <laughs> but yeah, I think that our conclusion is there that we really think documentation is important and it can help make life a lot easier. And we'll get, point people to the right place. Get on and do it. Welcome to the Ubuntu Eco thing. Like it. Good. Sounds good. What's up, Laura? Mm. Ubuntu One has moved from Ubuntu One dot com to one dot Ubuntu dot com. I, I know it doesn't sound like a big thing, like moving from one URL to another, but this came out after a massive discussion in with the community council about the naming of the product and do you remember all of that? And I heard some people being sort of very difficult and kept telling them to move from uh, ubuntu onecom to one.ubuntu.com. Is that right, Alan? No, I just made that. Uh, no. I just offered it as an option. And they took I it. I wasn't being difficult. So it's entirely uh, uh, thanks to you that this, is, this has happened. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. right okay. Yes. Well done. well done. Scott James Remnant has called for people willing to test the new Ubuntu boot stuff in Ubuntu Karmic. Now, this is the stuff to make it quicker. Well, it's the stuff building up to the stuff to make it quicker. <laughs> right. Because the stuff to make it quicker is not in disk release. The stuff that right. make because the target was 10 second boot, wasn't it? But that's not for this one. This That's for uh, 10, 10.04, right. 1010 and so on. What this is, is, is stuff like um, replacing the boot splash thing, mm-hmm. which was U splash. And on Fedora, we've mentioned they use Plymouth. Yes. We're going to use X splash. So we're going to start X very early on in the boot right. up process. And Scott's stuff in, he's got a PPA and loads of instructions on how to test it all out. So I tried it out on my laptop. And did it do the whole boot chart thing where you can see what's taking up how many seconds of boot yeah. time? And that's that's what he wants, actually, is the is the results of running boot chart. So right. he can see the difference before and after of the, of what changes he's made. And it's... Um, not made any difference from, to my machine from a speed perform- <laughs> but from a speed point of view. But I did have a bit of a, a problem the other day in that I booted up after doing all of this stuff, and it booted up just a black screen. And I Oops. thought, oh, oh dear. <laughs> but it was just the regular 
disc check thing that was happening in the background, oh. but he hasn't written the the thing that shows that Did on the screen yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, it was panicking slightly. Yeah. Just a disc light on permanently. <laughs> oh yeah, I can but, see why well, yeah. that would be slightly worrying. Yes. Ubuntu's had its uh, 2009 report card. Apparently it gets an A for hardware support, but a D for appearance. People mm. still don't like brown, do they? Yeah, this, this is Tanner Helland, who's written a uh, blog post about it, and he's it's, gone through... It's a really good article. Yeah, it is. It's, it's quite long, um, yeah. but it's worth taking the time to read through it, and he's gone through and graded various different aspects of Ubuntu from A through to well, A, B, C, D, and F, presumably for fail. <laughs> um, but nothing actually get, got an F, which is pretty oh, good going, good. I guess. Um, and he's reviewed... It's a very um, glass half full kind of point of view there. Well, well, we didn't fail. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm target oriented. Um, but he's used, basically, he's assessing the difference between 804 and 904. So a year's worth of development. Okay. Um, and he sort of thinks the hardware support's brilliant, the appearance, not so much. And he's got yeah. screenshots of Mac OS X and uh, Windows 7 and Ubuntu 904 and says which one of these looks like it was de- designed in 1995. <laughs> and then he throws, there's a screenshot of. Um, Five five oh four yeah five oh four from like eons ago yeah, hoary hedgehog and it doesn't actually look that different <laughs> no he says different wallpaper <laughs> that's about it <laughs> yeah that's about it slightly more uh, orange I guess but new new features and innovations he gives a B so things like three G network support um, guest account system janitor encrypted private directory um, and notification system and an X four support and things uh, he rates pretty highly um, it's very subjective though isn't it yeah. Yeah. It's you know for for me, if I went through that same list, I'd probably give it quite a high score in some ways. And I'm not particularly fussed about what it looks like. You've, you've seen all my machines; they're all the standard default look. And mm. I'm looking across at Laura's and hers is as well. Mm. And the real key is is how it compares with other distros. Well, you know, is it really? Well, we don't really want to take people away from Fedora and Arch, and we want to take people away from Windows and OS X. Surely, no. But we worry if you were doing worse than Fedora. I don't think we're doing worse than. Fedora. No, but if no, I'm not saying we are. But if if we were, it would be a worry. If we're doing better than every other Linux distribution out there, then we'd be best of breed. Mm-hmm. So it'd be interesting to see you know, what you would think of other distros. Yeah, that's yeah, fair point. That's yeah, my point. And that's all we've got in the eco thing this time. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for your feedback. James has taken issue with my title for our Ubuntu community segment. He writes. Ecosystem, a biosphere. Ecosphere is just a made-up word. Yeah, a quick Google for it turns up ecosphere is trademarked too. Ah, Interesting. Oh, yeah. dear. Oh. For both reasons, uh, Gerald is a more valid name, apparently. <laughs> well, well, we asked, <laughs> actually. you, didn't it? We did, yeah, it told me. Yeah. Uh, we actually asked um, via the identica, the, the Twitter and the Facebook. <laughs> <where> <laughs> 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 that's really hard to say, those. The definite <laughs> articles. Yes, um what people thought we should do about this. And we had some replies, didn't we, Laura? We did. Techno Viking said, don't end the debate, it's hilarious. <laughs> don't Thanks, think Mike. he really cares as long as we keep going. <laughs> well, it, you know, it populates at two minutes of our podcast. So <laughs> <laughs> it's easy content. Yeah, someone short of content, clearly. Someone else, Nightwise on Twitter, said Ubuntu underbelly. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Uh, Liam Wilson says George and... Um, Bill Mc, uh, McMahon oh god I've mispronounced that <laughs> M- oh. Bill Bill <laughs> <laughs> says Ubuntu Sphere oh. mm-hmm. Matt B90 also says Ubuntu Sphere no that's two mm-hmm. votes oh, we can't oh have dear. consensus um, Eric Johnson goes for the practical approach right and says why not just call it Community News ah oh, mm. I see what he's done there yeah <laughs> he's been all sensible and everything yeah, mm. yeah. it'll never catch on Ben Fox calls it Elephant Okay. He's yeah. got a bit hat stand there. <laughs> well, it was so massive. <laughs> ben Pritchard said Vera. I thought, oh. didn't we have Vera? No. I'd, I think no. we floated it as an idea one week. Ah, uh, okay. I don't think Vera ever made it to air. And finally, Dave Mark Robert Morley. Oh, yeah. himself. This, this has got to be good. <laughs> suggested the Ubuntu bog roll. That, I think that's a play on blog roll. Blog roll. Yeah. I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Maybe we could do merchandise and everything. <laughs> <laughs> that could really go badly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Declan McGrath from the Code Mongrel podcast asks, How do you publish separate feeds for each format type? Is this handled by the PodPress plugin that you use? Yes, it is, and it's quite painful. 
This is your secret sauce, though, isn't it, Alan? It's the thing, the thing I do, yeah, I, is publish the pages and get it wrong every week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, what was the last, last episode? Last episode was season one, episode 12. Uh, yes, yes. Not season two, episode 12. Yeah, basically, we've got WordPress and we've got the PodPress add-on. And every time we release a show, we create five pages. One which is the main page, which you see on the front page of the website, and then four more pages. Um, each one of those goes into a different category. Og high, og low, mp3 high, mp3 low, and that gives us our five feeds, the main one and then those four. And that's it. So PodPress doesn't do a huge amount. It's actually the fact that you have to create five posts for each episode. Yeah, that's the pain. And put them in different categories. And actually get it wrong on every single one of them <laughs> <laughs> in subtly different ways, <laughs> it seems to be. So if, if someone can write a new plugin, would that be helpful? Well, Dave, Dave keeps promising to throw some Django love at yes. this. Yes. Yeah. Um, but we've yet to see it. Scary. Yeah. <laughs> all about the Django. It's all. It's all in the. It's all <laughs> happening. I'm sure he's working on it. Yeah. Yeah. While he's not here. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what he's doing right now. Mm. Ross Anderson takes issue with our segment on software snobbery. Your discussion on snobbery caused me some problems because I'm not really interested in all this sudo and get stuff. I just want a computer that runs quickly and does everything I want it to. So it was a little galling to hear an undercurrent of, if you're not using the command line, then maybe you should be using Windows. Who said that? It was Dave. It was Dave. (laughs) And in fact, I felt a little bit guilty because me and Alan sort of had a go at him. So I don't think there was much of an undercurrent, really. Yeah, actually, that did get a bit heated. It was, point, yeah, it? it was really quite not about that. Yeah. Yeah, but I, absolutely. So I don't think that's our, our consensus in, in general. No, and it, no, it shouldn't no, no. be, should not it? Not at all. But Although, yeah. having said that, I did have to use the command line recently in order to support someone. And if I didn't have certain command line skills, I, there's no way I would have been able to help this person. Mm. So, yeah, there is a place for it, but not for everyone. Jonathan Thomas sent us a video response to our mention of the OpenShot video editor. We'll link to it in the show notes. That's really cool. It is. very (laughs) cool. It's fantastic. We had a video response. (laughs) That's fantastic. And it's edited in his own product, an open source video editor. And it's really neat. Yeah. 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 I mean, I will have to give it a go, OpenShot video editor. Because I think it's basically the comments that you and I made that got picked out (laughs) (laughs) more than anybody else, wasn't it? Okay. Such as, believe it when we see it, and do we really need another video editor? And the best comment in there was, um, in his video response, was something along the lines of, um, uh, uh, no bugs were found during the making (laughs) of this video. Yes. Which is something to be said, really. Yeah. (laughs) No, I shall give it a go for my next video project, I think. Patrick Archibald sent us a just a moment. I recently discovered the xdg-open command. This command opens a file or a URL in the user's preferred application. If a URL is provided, it will be opened in the user's preferred web browser. I use keyboard shortcuts to open my webmail, my intranet, my web RSS reader, and other frequently visited websites. To configure the shortcuts, I use gconf-editor or Compiz config settings manager if I have Compiz turned on. Lately, I've been using Chromium as my browser. Since Chromium is under heavy development, it occasionally becomes unusable, and I have to switch back to Firefox. I was hard coding the browser command in my keyboard shortcut bindings. This became problematic with frequent browser hopping. I now use the xdg-open command when defining my keyboard shortcuts. When switching browsers, I don't have to update each keyboard binding command. I just change my default browser using the menu system. I click System, Preferences, Preferred Applications, and change the web browser. All my shortcuts open the browser of the month. Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> Loads of information in there. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's great. Yeah. I've never used that. XD- I, I am aware of XDG as a very something somewhere. But, yeah. yeah. Oh, we're not allowed to talk about it, are we? No. It's well, we are. He's not allowed to. Oh, yes. And he can't yeah. because he's obviously not here and yes. he's somewhere in America. Um, but the preferred That's really app- cool. Thank you for yes, sending indeed. that in, Jane. Thank you, uh, Patrick. And the uh, preferred applications thing, um, I've never looked at before. And I usually use Thunderbird as my mail client. And it annoys me when I click on a link and a, a mail to link in a web page. Did you never know about that? I just never looked. So I had a little look and thought, oh, look, I can select Thunderbird. As and your preferred mail client. As my preferred mail You're client. You're too busy playing with the command line. That's what that is. Yeah. Not all about yeah, the you need to learn line. a bit more about the GUI. <laughs> <Clearly>. Snob. <laughs> James H. Fox email uh, James H. Fox even emailed in about the YouTube perfect script Alan mentioned in the last episode. I caught this recommendation on the last episode, and it has been the greatest headache alleviator I've come across in ages. You see, my wife's iMac has never gotten along very well with Flash. YouTube has been miserable to try and watch, with constant freezing and hiccups. Now though, up pops QuickTime and everything plays beautifully. 
Interestingly, I've yet to have an issue with Flash on my box running Mint. That is bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is cool. You heard quite a lot of feedback about this YouTube Perfect script, I think, didn't you? Yeah, yeah it's really cool. It's really easy to install as well. Mm. Grease Monkey and that YouTube Perfect thing, job done. I haven't tried it yet. You really should. Mm. It's, uh, you know, the, the thing that I used it for uh, this week was to watch Darren Brown do his stupid lottery thing over and over again to see how he did it. Did you work I, it out? I'll give you a clue. It's not in the program that was broadcast how he did it. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, David Winterbottom from commandlinefoo.com, Yay. which is where we confessed to stealing our command line lure from got in touch. I'm the creator of commandlinefoo.com, an avid Ubuntu user and a fan of your excellent podcast. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I've enjoyed the new command line love section. Uh, feel free to pluck whatever content you like uh, from the site to discuss. I've taken the liberty of adding a banner link through to your site from the bottom of each single command page, wow. which is wow. Um, I'm keen to support <laughs> Linux see, podcasts. What? See, Crown does pay. <laughs> 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 Uh, I'm keen to support Linux podcasts and other open source related resources uh, that will be of interest to the command line foo community and community. Uh, if there are any other worthy podcasts or projects that you think would fit this criteria, let me know and I'll link them in from the site. I have only room for uh, a couple, uh, so we'll have to rotate them. No, there, there aren't more. any uh, others. No, 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 there are no, none of no, those. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> That is amazing. That's really nice yeah. to get that mail. Yeah. And even nicer to have a link on every single command line through page. <laughs> yeah, I can't help feeling that we don't really deserve it, but it's a lovely thing to have. <laughs> now, I wonder if we stole some content from the BBC, if they'd link to us as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, from their legal pages. <laughs> he also says... One thing that you might be able to help me with is licensing. I would like to have the content of the command line foo site licensed so that it's clear that the content is freely available to use and alter, but I'm unsure what the best license would be. Some variant of Creative Commons seems sensible. Um, what would seem the most appropriate to you? Also, can I just retrospectively license all content in one go by slapping a few banners on the site, even though there has been no official license in place before? Could users object if I now distribute their content under a CC license that they didn't agree to when they submitted their stuff? I think the simple answer I is have yes. No well, idea. well, none of us are lawyers. Yes, with with that big proviso, yeah. Essentially, if if if, if people, people didn't, so, yeah, people contributed and didn't assign copyright over to you or say do with this what you like, then you shouldn't really just relicense it. Mm. You know, the projects that have had to move from GPL2 to GPL V3, like Samba and stuff, I've had to make sure that everybody's okay with the license change. Mm -hmm. Wikipedia did when it went from GNU free documentation license to the Creative Commons thing. PHP did as well. And Launchpad has as well. Yeah. And uh, the Ubuntu project for the Ubuntu documentation wiki as well. So the good news is it's obviously possible to do the move, but can, you should ask everybody. Can't you just release it under the knock yourself out license? Really? I mean, just say <laughs> Philly Boots. Does well, it have to be Yeah, but the problem license? is that nobody... The the people who contributed it's like what if I put something on command line foo and I I I put it in there under the proviso that they would be the only people who use it and the knock yourself out license which lets anyone use it in any way shape or form mm -hmm. I'm not happy about you know I I could protest and you know the chances are people won't they might but the kind of people who contribute yeah, sure. to command line foo are likely to be the kind of people who <laughs> probably would like open permissive licenses yeah. so you might be in luck. There's also a bit of a gotcha if you do use a Creative Commons license in that it's not compatible with things like the GPL. So you couldn't use a command line foo item in, a say, a GPL bash script or something. Mm. Mm. So there are little gotchas to get there. Licensing's a horrible subject. Knock yourself but, out. You know, yeah, yeah. Where, Knock yourself out. I think, for, for, for just, on all honesty, for one-liners, public domain. You might as well just go public domain and, and let anybody do what you like with them. you RMS on your tail for public domain. Uh, I, think even he, I think even he says for, for short things it's not just worth it. Maybe we should domaining. get him on the show and ask him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that's going to happen. We'd have to rename the GNU to UK podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for all your feedback and we'll have some more next time. Right, it's boiling hot in here. It's time to get out of here. Let's wrap the show up, guys. Okay. That was a fun pack show. It was. Thanks for listening, and thanks to everyone who took part via Twitter and Identica. And Facebook. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you'd like to get a hold of us, uh, you can email us share via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can leave us a voicemail in a number of ways. Telephone 0845 508 1986 or VoIP podcast at sip.ubuntu-uk.org or Skype us at Ubuntu UK Podcast. You can send us your comments and get updates from recording sessions on Identica or Twitter, where we are at UUPC. 
Uh, join our Facebook fan page. Search for Ubuntu, a UK podcast. We welcome your just a moments, your command line loves, reviews, rants and feedback, both positive and negative. So please, please, please do get in touch. And thanks also to our network of community mirrors listed on the website. See you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.